Welcome to EPG Patshala. Today we'll be dealing with uh, this paper on Indian polity and our special focus will be on Vedic polity, both early Vedic and later Vedic. Now, as we know, the Vedic period is a very crucial juncture in early Indian history because from this period only, we get a lot of material, a wealth of material about various aspects of life, about social, cultural and political life in early India. And uh, we can trace the origin of some of the institutions that developed in the later period in the Rig Vedic context. The objectives of this module is to explore the various institutions that blossomed in the early Vedic period and to further investigate the changes that began to surface in later Vedic period. Uh, the main focus of this module will be to understand the transition from kin-based polity to the formation of territorial units. So it has been said that as the Rig Vedic texts were uh, of a sacred nature, the texts would not contain uh, any political material. But in the Rig Veda, we have uh, a plethora of hymns which refer to prayers to deities who are expected to help humans to overcome their enemies. Accounts of kin conflicts also figure prominently in the Rig Veda. Another interesting fact to note is that the Vedic corpus was also aware of the role of popular tribal assemblies. In short, images of polity and political situations are not entirely absent from the voluminous Vedic literature. In the Rig Veda, we come across uh, some terms like the Jano and the Vesh, which all refer to a group of people, a collection of people, and all of them are of a tribal nature. The Jano of the Rig Veda can be translated as a tribe, and the Vesh uh, is often translated as a clan. An even smaller and more primitive unit was the grama, but uh, it did not stand for uh, a village like it does uh, in these days and it perhaps connoted a combination or a small band-like group which was peripatetic and moved about from one place to another. Then we have the kulo or the family which is the smallest unit within a clan or a tribe. Uh, we have another term which is uh, Gana and this has been translated as lineage. A lineage is a group of uni unilineal kin. The lineage is very different from an egalitarian band and played a dominant role in determining meaning access to resources, power and status. Those who were of a senior lineage could claim uh, access to resources and those who were of a junior lineage could not. Uh, we have uh, almost 300 clans or tribes mentioned in the Rig Veda. Preeminent among them were a collection of five tribes labeled in the Rig Veda as Panchajana or Panchakrishti. The Rig Veda uses the term Gavishti as a synonym of, for war that fits in well with the predominantly cattle keeping material culture of the Rig Vedic times. So, as you understand, the clashes between tribes uh, was mainly to uh, augment the resource base and the unit of wealth, the items of wealth were mainly associated with uh, cattle. Uh, there was the first blossoming of notions of authority in the Rig Vedic period 
though uh, this is very different from uh, what we have in the later texts and it is extremely difficult to equate the Rig Vedic term Rajan or Raja with the head of a monarchical state which would emerge at a later period. The monarchical state had a ruler who would normally have a well-defined territory a subject population and command over a standing army. In the Rig Vedic context, the territorial unit was not defined. Uh, we don't have references to a st standing army and we have no clue as to whether tribute was collected by the ruling classes regularly. In the Rig Veda, the Raja was not known as Nripati or Narapati, Bhupati, Adhipati and Mahipati. Please note that all these terms are connected with landed wealth and uh, express a kind of domination over a subject population. Instead of Nripati, Narapati or Bhupati, the Rig Vedic Rajan often bore the epithet of Gopa or Gopati, which is connected with cattle wealth in the tribal context. The principal qualities on which the Raja's position rested were his abilities to lead in the wars and to ensure collection of booty. The principal task of redistribution among the clan members was also probably carried out by the Raja. The reference to the chief as Gopa or Gopati indicates that protecting and increasing of the cattle herd was another of his principal functions. We have uh, no references to regular tax collection or tribute collection from the clan members. We have a term Bali, which refers to which can uh, mean many things to many people, but one of the meanings is uh, it is an offering made to the gods, but it could also mean a form of tribute offered by the clansmen to the Rajan periodically. Mostly, it was assumed to have been voluntary. Tribute was most probably also collected from tribes defeated in a battle. So we can uh, conclude that a regular taxation system had not yet emerged. Uh, another important feature of Vedic polity is of course the various tribal assemblies which checked and regulated the authority of the king or the Rajan. Uh, some of the tribal assemblies are of course the Sabha, the Samiti, the Gana and the Vidatha, which played an important part in the life of the early Vedic period. The first two had definite political functions to perform and it has been mentioned in the sources that the Rajan could not run the government without their support and their cooperation. The distinctions between their functions are not absolutely clear, but uh, we can assume that uh, Sabha was a more exclusive, smaller unit with an elite membership, while the Samiti appears to have been a larger assembly of the people and it was most certainly presided over by the Rajan. The third uh, assembly, which is the Gana, was also not without political significance, but it was most probably a tribal collective with pronounced military functions. We have the members of Kana bearing arms and fighting their enemies. Another very intriguing uh, term is the Vidatha and the role of the Vidatha in the Vedic polity has been debated but Aris Sharma has enlightened us with his study of the Vidatha, which he terms as a popular assembly or a folk assembly in the Rig Vedic context. The Vidatha was attended 
by the members of the fish or the Jano and the Raja alike. So R.S. Sharma here is arguing that it was a more inclusive assembly. Uh, no less significant was its role as a place for where the booties captured in war were distributed among the members of the clan with a possible share, special share for the Raja or the chief of the clan. J.P. Sharma uh, has controverted this claim and has uh, said that uh, Vidatha could be a local congregation of people where uh, the members gathered to perform some socio-religious ceremonies. So here the economic and political role of the Vidatha has been uh, negated by J.P. Sharma. Another very important feature of the Vedic polity was the narratives that described tribal conflicts between tribes and between uh, segments of tribes. Among many references to the clashes and battles, outstanding are the impressions of a major battle fought on one side by ten chiefs and on the other by Sudas, the chief of the Tritsu Bharatas. Michael Witzel shows that the Bharata clan was given a very prominent place in the family books, which are the earliest uh, portions of the Rig Veda. The account of the battle contained in book 7 uh, is has been described as a snapshot of history which narrates the advance of the Bharatas across the Sindhu into the present Punjab plains. So uh, in this narrative uh, the motive of conquest is associated and linked to the motive of migration. So conquest and migration came together. D.D. Kosambi surmised that this was one of the earliest known instances of war in Indian history for controlling rivers. Remembering the famous burning down of the Khandava forest in the Mahabharata, it is likely that the victory in the Dasharaja war helped the Bharatas to uh, move up to Kurukshetra in Haryana uh, and to the south of which was located the Khandava forest. So on the whole, about the nature uh, of Vedic polity, we can say that at best it was a tribal chieftainship without the hello of monarchy, lacking in firm territorial basis and devoid of taxation, standing army and permanent public officials, which all constitute the essential ingredients of the state. The chieftain owed its power to the support of the clan assemblies whose military functions forcibly strike our attention. Now we'll move on to the later Vedic phase which saw the evolution of the various institutions that took shape in the early Vedic period. The early Vedic corpus had been dated to 1500 BCE and the later Vedic phase starts from about 1000 BCE. In the Brahmana literature, uh, especially in uh, the Oitarya Brahmana, there are stories that describe fights between gods and demons and the gods were continuously defeated in battle and uh, they were hapless and realized that they needed a suitable leader uh, to overcome the demons. So the essential monarchy as the essential element of the state is beginning to grow in the later Vedic period. Uh, the chief feature of uh, this period is of course the beginnings of sedentary life 
when the people were settling down and agrarian activities became the focal point of the economy. Here we are encountered with the fact that all the small tribal units were uh, merging and forming bigger and bigger units which uh, sought to settle down at fixed areas and areas were being named after the people who settled. The Krivis and Purus of Rigvedic times came together and formed the Kuru tribe who in turn allied with the Panchalas and the two together occupied the whole of Western UP. So this region came to be known as the Kuru Panchala region. Secure in their regular income, they would support a good number of priests who developed rituals that constitute our only important source for the profile of later Vedic polity, that is the Brahmana literature. Settled life created conditions for the differentiation of the Vedic people into four Varnas. So this is a new arrangement of social hierarchies that we encounter in the later Vedic period. Brahmanas, who originally formed one of the 16 classes of priests, outstripped all the others and came out on top. And in the Vedic ritual text, they, uh, they took over the Vedic ritual texts and claimed both social and political privileges. So this is the phase when we start uh, to see the growing uh, bonds between the ruling classes and the priestly classes. The influence of Varna dist distinctions and that of the Brahmanas first come to the fore in the political organs during later Vedic period. The Kshatriyas whose power and authority was regularly being refreshed and legitimized by the Brahmanas through religious ceremonies and rituals, functioned as rulers and Vaishyas who were part of the Vish mentioned in the uh, early Vedic literature, became their position, became uh, relegated and they were uh, functioning as unwilling tribute pairs. Rituals outlined in later Vedic texts resound with conflicts between tribal and the territorial facets of the emerging kingship. The territory was still, uh, the notion of territory was still fluctuating and so the king was announced to the deities and the people by name, parentage and clan. So the notion of territory was still not stable. Such rights as chariot race, cattle raid and game of dice are intended to demonstrate the supremacy of the royal candidate over his kinsmen. Some of these games were fixed and the uh, king was, uh, the king came out as the winner through the collusion of the uh, clansmen. The Atharva Veda contains a song of election of the king and wishes that the Rashtra or the territory to be held by the king would be made firm by the king Varuna, the god Brihaspati, Indra and Agni. In the later texts, the element of ele election goes missing and the very fact of, of performing an elaborate coronation ritual called the Rajasu, which uh, sometimes extended over two years, shows the necessity of having a fixed place. So the king now had a context, the Raja now had a context, which is the Rajya. According to a passage from the Taittiriya Samhita, 
an early Yajurveda collection. The king is announced in this tribe, in this kingdom, which shows that, that the tribe and the geographical region occupied by the tribe were becoming coeval. Um, in the later Vedic phase, there was a further development of the concept of territoriality. The Oitorya Brahmana enumerates 10 forms of government or chieftainship prevalent in different parts of the country, which shows that power was established in fixed areas. The notion of territory is being foregrounded in the texts. Though most term, terms used for these forms cannot be precisely defined for the Vedic period, Ekoraja may mean the ruler whose authority was undisputed in his domains. Hitherto, the chief or the king distributed only the spoils of war, mainly cattle and women and slaves among the priests. Now, he claimed to grant a part of land with the concept of the clan. So land became an important item of wealth which had to be gifted to the priest who in turn legitimized the growing power of the ruler. From now on, it is clear that the king now belonged to the Kshatriya class and what really mattered to him was the support of the priests for domination over the mass of the people. The king is called the protector of the Brahmanas and the eater of the people. Some ritual stress the superiority of priests and others the superiority of warriors. But in reality, it seems that there was a kind of collusion between the ruler and the spiritual specialist. The king has to give a, had to give a pledge of standing by the law to the Brahmana priest and the Shatapatha Brahmana states that the king and the Shrotriya together upheld the dharma. Another important feature uh, of kingship was the budding hereditary nature of kingship. Though the coronation rituals recall the original election of the king, the Aitariya Brahmana prescribes formulas for securing kingship for one, two and three generations. Uh, a formula from the Shatopatha Brahmana extends it to 10 generations. We also come across the, no the term Rajaputra, which signifies that the king's son appeared as the heir to the throne. Thus, kingship or chiefship became confined within a family. Uh, about uh, any divine element in the institution of kingship, we have no clear evidence of this type in the Rig Veda that we have already seen. But in the later Vedic texts, we have the consecration ceremonies which invoke different gods to endow the king with their respective qualities. So the gods intervene to uh, legitimize and valorize the kingly office. And sometimes the king, king is even represented as a god in the later Vedic texts. There are uh, dev further developments that indicate uh, the emergence of uh, organized taxation system and uh, a systematized administrative machinery. Stable agriculture, as we have seen, made uh, available moderate surplus in kind. The king uh, is depicted as the devourer of the people. It shows that he lived on tributes collected from his kinsmen and others. We come across a term, uh, Bhagadugha, 
which can mean that there was a person who distributed shares on behalf of the chief. In Western UP, this would be a portion of wheat, rice and other cereals mentioned in the later Vedic texts. Uh, at least 12 of the Ratnins who formed the main support base of the monarch seem to have been regular officials who were evidently supported out of the taxes collected by the state. These people were not concerned with the prevention of crimes, but with certain positive functions uh, possibly inherited from tribal bodies. So you see the tribal uh, trend also continues and it uh, blends with uh, the emerging propensities of the budding state. Further, several of them, uh, the Ratnins, were associated with the distribution of game, cattle, land, cereal, etc., which again uh, highlights their tribal connection. The continued practice of distribution among the kinsmen cut down social inequality and hence obstructed the strengthening of the chiefly authority. The king um, distributed uh, spoils of war among his kinsmen, so the tribal practice is still continuing and this uh, in fact created a bond, this still recreated a bond between the king and his kinsmen. The king was still surrounded by his kinsmen. As the notion of collecting taxes appear, we are bound to have some coercive forces which extracted these tributes from the kinsmen. So now we have the Senani who heads the list of the Ratnins in the Shatapatha Brahmana. Shatapatha Brahmana is a lead text. In the earlier texts, the Senani is not that important. In the Shatavata Brahmana, he suddenly becomes more important. So, uh, the army emerged as an important element towards the end of the Vedic period. Uh, a fact which is also supported by the inclusion of the makers and drivers of chariots in the list of Ratnins. Even at this stage, the army was confined to the kinsmen, so it was not a professional army, not a standing army, which was uh, paid by the state. The later Vedic period perhaps marks the beginning of the royal bodyguards. We have a further uh, development of the coercive apparatus. The king here claims to banish the Brahmana, to overpower the Vaishya and to beat the Shudra. Uh, this could not materialize without a resounding coercive apparatus. It is through these references to the Sthapati and Satapati, indications of a regular system of provincial administration comes to the fore. But these officials find no place in the list of Ratnins, nor does the Adhikarta, who is uh, regarded as the village officer appointed by the king. So this uh, system of provincial arrangement and local officers was not very clearly defined in this period. Another very interesting feature is the gradual decline of the tribal assemblies and uh, the changes in their functions. The Sabha and Samiti became more aristocratic and uh, this came to be monopolized by the male gender. Women were now completely excluded from these bodies. The popular assemblies also lost some of their activities to new officials like uh, the function of tax collection and became attenuated in both functions and composition. Uh, to sum up, 
what we have learned so far, we can say that uh, later Vedic polity, although far more developed in royal power and administrative structure than the Rig Vedic polity, fell short of the Saptanga theory of the state. Really, it represents a phase of transition from tribal organization to Varna and territorial organization under male domination. The process was nearing completion towards the end of the Vedic period. So, from the kin-based polities of the Rig Veda, we uh, can trace the development of territorial units, a more well-defined uh, institution of the monarchy, systems of tax collection and coercive forces, but still we do not come across full-fledged states because the army was still uh, kin-based and the functions of the royal officials were not clearly defined. For further information on this subject, please visit EPG Patshala. Thank you.